All right. There we go. And take two. Well, good morning again, everybody. Um, welcome to this presentation from the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is the second um, in our series of um, pediatric uh, juvenile inflammatory arthritis um, webinars. And today we're going to focus on differentiating mechanical versus inflammatory joint symptoms in children and adolescents. Next slide, Haley. So my name is Chris Peltier. I'm a general pediatrician in private practice in Cincinnati, and I also have the honor of serving as the president-elect of the chapter. And it is my pleasure to introduce our content experts uh, for this morning. Um, Jennifer Huggins is a pediatric rheumatologist at Cincinnati Children's, and she is our rheumatology lead for this project. And really honored today to have one of uh, Dr. Huggins' colleagues um, at Cincinnati Children's, Shannon Darnell, who um, works very closely with Dr. Huggins in the Division of Physical Therapy at Cincinnati Children's. So welcome to you both. Next slide, Haley. So just some brief learning objectives. So we're going to review the diagnostic criteria for hypermobility. We're going to uh, take a look at some conditions that are commonly associated with hypermobility. So if you have a patient with hypermobility, these may be things that you might wanna be on the lookout for. And then really our main focus today is going to be um, to help distinguish um, joint, system, joint symptoms that are caused from inflammatory causes from those that are from mechanical causes. Next slide. So let's start with a case. So you have a 10 year old in your office that presents with pains in her hips, her knees, her ankles, and her wrists. The swelling is occasional. She describes it as mild and it is not persistent. After delving in a little bit further, you, you find out that the pain usually occurs after she plays soccer. Now she does have some trouble falling asleep because of the pain. And when you look through her chart, you notice a history of recurrent patellar subluxations and ankle sprains. Next slide. On physical exam, she's thin but well appearing. You don't find any swelling, tenderness, or limitation of motion noted in any joints. Her knees do hyperextend 15 degrees and her elbows hyperextend 10 degrees. She is able to touch her palms to the floor without bending her knees. And you also note that she has bilateral pes planus. Her skin exam reveals several areas of ecchymosis on the anterior shins and forearms, and she has a thin healed scar on her knee. Next slide. So what's the diagnosis? I'm gonna give you guys a chance to sort of be interactive a little bit, but for this one, I'm gonna, we're gonna sort of give you the answer, and I'm gonna let Dr. Huggins jump in and, and kind of walk through this case a little bit and talk about the diagnosis. Jennifer? Great. So um, we know as uh, primary care physicians that um, the expectations of what you're supposed to figure out in a very short amount of time is, is almost unrealistic. So one of the goals of today is just to try to simplify things and help you know, like, um, I think you're quite good at figuring out sports medicine issues and uh, infection issues, but we want to try to help you figure out, you know, when it might be most appropriate to send the patient to Shannon or one of her colleagues, or most appropriate to send the patient to rheumatology. And we're hoping that we will give you some tools that will enable you to do this in the in the very limited time that you are given to evaluate the patients. So um, next slide. I think that most of you will know that this is someone that's very hypermobile. And that would be actually, in general, a reason to send the patient to Shannon. Um, one in 100 people is flexible. Uh, so um, it's not possible for you know, rheumatology to accommodate all those. And plus, we are actually sometimes at the same, um, in the same place as you are that, that they really, we can evaluate and make sure they don't have arthritis, but then we need to send them to PT because those are the people that can really help them with their uh, joint mobility. So next slide, please. So as you're probably confused by, cause I am, and so are patients, there are just many different names for this joint hypermobility. Um, the one I like to use is generalized joint hypermobility. And we're gonna go through what a Biton score is. It, this is something that's quite easy for you to do and not very time consuming. Um, 
Hypermobility joint syndrome is sometimes used, benign hypermobility joint syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos uh, type three. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome has become quite popular, but in all honesty, for the hypermobility, they're really what the Ehlers and Danlos did not describe a syndrome associated with that. That's something that's been created since then. And really what I like to tell patients is that in general, being flexible like this, you know, my, I like tennis and Novak Djokovic is my favorite tennis player and he's amazingly flexible and that's why he's making millions of dollars playing tennis, but he takes PT and OT with him wherever he goes throughout the world. So, um, so that it does have its advantages. Next slide, please. So there are conditions associated with hypermobility and um, this would be where it would be appropriate to get help from other people if you're just not sure, you know, is this a straightforward person that meets the Biden criteria? Um, because other things will make you flexible like Marfan syndrome or sticklers is something where you have joint laxity in some places, but not in others. Um, many of these are things that the geneticist will help you figure out. Homocystinuria, osteogenesis imperfecta, those people are um, very flexible. Williams syndrome, that's something that you would be alerted to probably way before rheumatology. And then just to know that the Down syndrome, it's, it's, uh, it's really that they have very low tone, but they will look like someone that's hypermobile. Next slide, please. So when we're referring to joint hypermobility, we're re referring to the ability to painlessly perform the following five maneuvers. So this is the Biden scoring five maneuvers, so next slide. The first is, can you oppose your thumb to your forearm? And if you can do that on either side, that's two points. Yes, <laughs> next slide. Can you put your fifth finger parallel to your forearm? Most people that can do the fifth finger can do all. You can see by my demonstration that I'm the least flexible person around, but um, so this would be an, an additional two points, one on each side. Next slide, please. And then at the elbow, can you hyperextend the elbow to minus 10 degrees? And you can really see that by inspection. You don't need a goniometer to do so, but those would be measurements that PT and OT would be doing for us, but uh, that would be an additional two. So now we're up to six already in the Biden score, if you can do this on each side. Next slide, please. And then can you hyperextend your knees or another term we give to this is genu recurvatum. Um, and that again needs to be 10 degrees, but you can see this without a goniometer as well when you're observing them in a standing position. And then the last one that makes the Biden score up to nine, if you have all of them, next slide please, is can you put your palms on the floor without bending your knees? And what I've learned from our physical therapy colleagues is that many hypermobile people cannot do this but it's because their hamstrings are very tight and their hamstrings get very tight because that's what helps them stay upright because their core is quite weak. And so they compensate by having very tight hamstrings. Next slide, please. So this would be the Biden scoring. You need a score of, of four or greater. Um, but again, you know, six of them are in the upper extremity two are in the knees, and then one, can you put your palms on the floor? Can, can I ask you a question about the Biden score real quick? How commonly do you see, um, if it, for, this, the, for the, the, when you're looking at both extremities, how common is it to, to it, do, do you almost always, if you have it in the right, you're gonna have it in the left, or is it common to just have it on, on one side, or is there any, what's your experience with that? Well, I swear I didn't ask Chris to ask that question, but it's very important to, yes, if they are really having issues with just hypermobility, it's usually pretty symmetric. So, you know, one in a hundred people is flexible. So many of our kids with JA are flexible. So if you see asymmetry, that would be a reason to let me or one of my colleagues scope it out before you, or, or if you send it to Shannon, she's going to come and say, hey, this doesn't add up. But yes, it's right. most common if it's on one side, it's gonna be on the other. Now, it, they may not have their thumb opposed to their forearm, but have other things. But if you, if you see asymmetry, that's a reason to let rheumatology scope it out before you um, 
before you send them to Shannon or don't worry, Shannon, I'll send them to me. Um, yes, next slide, please. So the other things that you can look for, and uh, I gave you a link um, in a couple slides down to a community practice tool. So if you see these kind of skin findings, like that the skin is really elastic or that they have a scar that's like what we call cigar paper or, or um, cigarette paper thin, those are red flags that you, that genetics should get involved. Um, so if you, you can see these, but if you do see these, then these are red flags and that community practice tool kind of gives you some guidelines about, you know, when you should be more worried. Um, next slide, please. And then these are things that you, um, you know, that come to you as well, but don't be alarmed. So first of all, we get sometimes kids referred at age three for hypermobility. You should be worried if a child at age three is not flexible. So you, you start to lose your flexibility um, around the age of five or six. So before that, that doesn't mean that they don't need help from Shannon for their joint issues, but it's not, um, you know, not necessarily that you're going to put them in this hypermobility category. Um, they tire easily, and probably a big part of that is that the same collagen that makes up the ligaments and tendons of the joints also lines your blood vessels. So in, in order for them to feel hydrated, they have to fill a balloon, not a, not a rigid hose like an old lady like me. So they tire easily in large part, either because they're, they're starting to get some joint pain from their flexibility or because they're not hydrated enough. And hydration is a key thing that, that our physical therapists harp on them with as well. Um, you can see some joint swelling on occasion. And so that's why we're trying to, to help you distinguish. And then when we get to the joints, we'll, uh, the exam, we'll talk about this more, but the, the swelling is because they're pu pulling little tiny fibers of the ligaments and tendons away from the, from the bone due to overstretching or overactivity. That effusion is usually not warm and it's usually very short lived. So in a fusion with arthritis, it's there until we do something to make it better and it's warm. But intermittent swelling um, can very well be from hypermobility. Next slide, please. And then this is the resource, this is the link. And then once you get to this site, you actually go under human genetics and then there's a PDF on hypermobility. And Shannon was one of the key players in forming this. Um, and so she would, if you have any questions, you can certainly ask her or you can ask me, but also, uh, you know, if there's ways that, that we can improve this tool, just let us know, but this, this will be a, you know, you've got these red flags or these things that you're not sure, um, you know, if you should be worried about them, then hopefully the guideline will, will guide you. Otherwise, we're available. We give our email addresses at the end. You know, feel free to reach out to us and we'll see how we can help. Okay. Now, I think we're going to work, right, Chris, your turn. Right. Okay. So with sort of that in background, basically what we're going to kind of do is... Um, Jennifer and Shannon are going to kind of walk us through sort of different joints. So, and really we're going to look at the differentiation between inflammatory and mechanical symptoms. Um, I put in the chat box, if you guys have questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll kind of answer them as we go. And I also put, we will be sending out a copy of these slides um, in the next day or two. So next slide, please. So I'll, I'll just make some comments about this and, and Jennifer and, and Shannon, feel free to, to jump in, right? So, you know, obviously history, history, history is going to be the most important thing. So when you're taking sort of a joint history, you know, obviously, is it pain? Is there pain involved? Where's the location? Is it a single joint versus multiple joints? And then large joint versus small joint? We know that certain rheumatologic disorders are going to affect large joints, whereas some are going to affect small joints. Is this a new problem? Has this been going on for a week? Or as often we see, you know, we'll have somebody come in with, I I've had knee pain for, for four years now. And then what's, what's the um, uh, presentation? Is it constant or is it, no, it hurts just a couple of times a week. Um, is there any antecedent trauma or, or infection? And I think Shannon had made a, co a comment in the, the chat box that, um, 
previous injury to a joint like the elbow may lead to one side presenting as more hypermobile than the other. And then of course, are there other signs and symptoms? Um, is there any is things that might make you think infection, fever? Is there a rash, swelling? Are there GI complaints? Obviously triggers. So we know that certain disorders are gonna affect more first upon rising in the morning versus those that get worse throughout the day with increased activity. Does physical positioning make it better, make it worse? Is it better or worse with physical activities? And then of course, what makes it better, right? So stretching, make the stretching make it better? Do anti-inflammatories and, and how much does it get better? Next slide. And you want me to do this one? I do. I'll let, I'll let, I'll let um, Jennifer run through this slide. Sure. So again, um, thinking about um, your busy day, um, I tried to consolidate some of the key things in the history. If you're thinking between, because I think you guys are, uh, you know, way better than me about injury. Um, you usually know if they've had a recent strep infection or things like that, that would help guide a need to send it to us. So these are things really distinguishing primarily between JA and hypermobility, although they do apply to mechanical versus any inflammatory thing. M morning stiffness, if you have morning stiffness, uh, you should be concerned about an inflammatory process. Occasionally the hypermobility people will say that they're stiff in the morning, but if you really ask them, they're, they have a lot of pain and the symptoms are really worse after activity, worse at the end of the day. Um, and that is not what happens with our kids with JA. They are stiff in the morning. Once they get moving, they feel pretty good. The activity actually helps them. There are a few areas where they might have arthritis that could be, the neck is extremely painful. Uh, the hip, um, it just doesn't have enough room for all the joint fluid. So that becomes quite painful and subtalar joint. And we're gonna go through what we mean by subtalar. But in general, like when we hear about a child with diffuse, a lot of pain, then we say, oh, this isn't going to be inflammatory. This is going to be some sort of mechanical problem. Uh, pain with activity, again, is mechanical. Symptoms worse in the morning is inflammatory. Our kids with arthritis are not awaking from sleep in pain. So if, you're, if your sleep is disrupted, it is more than likely a mechanical issue. If the swelling is intermittent, it's also not likely to be inflammatory. The inflammatory swelling, it's there until we make it better. Um, and we don't see fever with our kids with inflammatory arthritis unless it's systemic J. And then those kids really have way more systemic features than they do arthritic features. And then of course you can have uh, the, the uh, rash sort of the uh, evanescent rash with systemic JA or, you know, look for psoriasis because a lot of times the, if you have psoriasis over your knee, then the arthritis that occurs with psoriatic arthritis will be underneath that patch of psoriasis. But you don't see a rash with the mechanical usually, but also we don't see very much rash in JIA. Hopefully that helps. All right, next slide. And then I think this is. All right. So uh, let's get amongst it. So this is our first case um, looking at specific joints. So this is a two-year-old female who comes into your office with a persistently swollen left knee and has a limp. Her parents noticed the swollen knee after a fall, although they were honestly surprised by this finding as they thought that the fall was not that bad. Thinking back, they wonder if she may have been limping slightly before then, and, but her gait definitely seems more unsteady lately. She does not complain of pain, but she seems stiff in the morning for a couple of hours the last two weeks. Next slide. On physical exam, her left knee is warm, it's swollen, and she has difficulty strengthening her leg. You do note a, a leg length discrepancy with the, the left being um, longer than the right, and all of her other joints are normal. Next slide. All right, so in the chat box, put whether you think this is mechanical or inflammatory, and then we'll see the right answer. And it's okay if, if it's wrong. So just open up your chat box. So we've got a, a vote for inflammatory. Anyone else? 
Dr. Gorman, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to go with inflammatory. Next slide. All right, Jennifer, you want to walk us through this and point out some of the uh, pertinent findings? Well, so in, in each of these, um, first of all, the knee is persistently swollen. Um, her gait is unsteady. Um, so our kids with swollen knees, you know, sometimes, and we already told you the leg is longer, one leg is longer than the other. So they're going to walk funny, but they're not limited by pain. So she doesn't have pain. She's stiff in the morning. She has a very unsteady gait. And then next slide, please. And the un unsteady gait is because the left leg uh, is longer than the right. Um, and she can't straighten the leg more than likely because the, there's a bit of a contracture there. Some of that, uh, the leg length discrepancy gives you some idea of the chronicity, uh, but difficulty straightening is, is what they have. They don't complain of pain, but they're limited in mobility because of the fluid that's there. And then always the, the, there's warmth over the knee. And we're gonna go through that with the exam. So next slide, please. So we have put in for each of the joints that we're going to review, we put in the anatomy just to kind of get you oriented. Um, you would not want me to teach you anatomy because it's not my forte, but um, just to point out that, you know, there's a, these are condylar joints, meaning that the uh, femur opposes both the, the tibia and the fibula. There's ligaments, menisci, and bursa involved. And you guys are quite familiar with the ligaments and menisca and even bursa because of trauma, et cetera. So uh, next slide, please. So the basically uh, in all of these things, we're trying to give you very um, things that can be done in a very short amount of time. So this girl comes, she's got an unsteady gait and she's got some swelling in her knee. So you can tell a lot just by looking at her. She's gonna stand up and she's gonna go walk and try to get on the exam table. So the, when in standing, you wanna look and see is, are the legs, do they look the same? Do the knees look the same? Do you see a rash? Do you see the knee bent indicating a contracture? Um, or can she hyperextend the knee indicating maybe more mechanical? Is there swelling in the super patellar pouch? And we'll sh show you that in just a minute. Um, if so, that's more than likely inflammatory. If not, it's more likely mechanical. And any time you see a Baker cyst, you really have to think of an inflammatory condition. And regardless, we should be the ones trying to help you follow that along. That is not a normal, uh, normal entity in, in a child or adolescent. Um, next slide, please. So after you look, oh, these are some examples. So clearly the asymmetry is very easy to see in the first picture where the uh, right leg is significantly longer. Look in the super patellar pouch and you do that by looking at the bottom of the bed. So they're laying flat and you're looking from their toes up towards their head. If you see super patellar swelling, that's probably something that should come to us. And then you can see this little girl with the knee, her left knee is so swollen that it's contracted. She can't straighten that leg out, uh, but it isn't causing her much pain. And then another example of the genu recorvatum for hypermobile people where, um, so, so this can happen in our kids with JIA as well. They can be flexible, but both are not gonna be bending back like that if they have arthritis in their knee. Next slide, please. And then um, you want to just put your, lay your hands on the knee. It should go from your lower leg should be um, warm over the knee should be cold, and then over the thigh should be warm. That would be normal. If the knee is warmer, it doesn't have to be hot like the infections that you see, but if the knee is warmer than above and below, uh, then that would be a reason to be concerned about inflammatory. Um, and then there's a video, uh, Shannon is gonna show you how to look for the joint fluid by milking it. Um, so we'll, we'll move to the next slide. And then um, the range of motion is, is important, um, you know, but some of that you can see if it's inflammatory, you can see already because the knee will be contracted. It won't straighten all the way. Um, and again, Shanna does a good job of, of showing this in the video. So I think we'll move to the next slide, which is actually Shannon.
So I will assess for warmth. I will feel below the knee, on the knee, above the knee. Inflammation would indicate I would feel warmth at the knee. I'll then palpate for inflammation. I'd come above the knee, milking down, come below the knee, looking for bulging on either side. I then would assess um, for range of motion. I'd look to see if there was full range of motion or decreased range of motion. I'd assess for flexibility, decreased hamstring flexibility, and then I would look for extension. And with inflammation, I would see a lack of extension. Comparing it to the other side, coming up, full flexion, full extension or hyperextension. Does anybody have any questions about the knee exam? And we're a small enough group. If you have a question, feel free to unmute it and just go ahead and ask your question. And I'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions about the knee before we move on to our next joint. I do think the next, there is one more video where Shannon demonstrates what you might see if it was more mechanical. Thank you for reminding me of that. Haley, do you wanna go ahead and show the next one? And then we'll take a break to see if anyone has any questions. Yeah. So I will assess for warmth. I will feel below the knee, on the knee, above the knee. Inflammation would indicate I would feel warmth at the knee. I then palpate for inflammation. I'd come above the knee, milking down, come below the knee. Oh, we're on the same video. We needed to go to the next slide, sorry. This would be assessment of the knee that would indicate mechanical cause as opposed to inflammatory. I would still feel for temperature. It would be the same temperature above on the knee and below the knee. I would then palpate for effusion and I would see no bogginess, no um, inflammation on either knee. I would then look at patellar mobility. On this one, I would see excessive patellar mobility, both sides going in and out and up and down. And then I would look for flexibility. I may see a decrease in flexibility um, or no, no deficit in flexibility. Here I see a mild decrease in flexibility. I would also look for range of motion full flexion, full extension with mild genuine bottom, full flexion, mild genuine bottom. Great. I, I find these videos so helpful. Thank you, Shannon, for doing these. I mean, this is a very nice, concise way. Sometimes I feel like I'm fumbling through my joint exam. So it just kind of helps sort of focus in a very systemic way. Does anybody have any questions about the knee for either Jennifer or Shannon before we move on to our next joint? All right, Haley, go ahead and we'll move on to our next case. So this is a 16-year-old male athlete who comes to your office with right ankle swelling. He has morning stiffness that can last for up to an hour. The swelling in his ankle is persistent, and it's been present for three weeks. He reports pain in the bottom of his right foot that's been there for almost two months, and he's reverted to wearing flip-flops because of the pain and swelling in his feet. Next slide. On physical exam, you note asymmetry between his right and his left ankle. There's bogginess around the medial and lateral malleoli of the right foot with increased warmth. The bottom of his right foot is extremely painful with palpation, and you note swelling over the insertion of the right Achilles tendon. Next slide. All right, so feel free to enter in the chat box whether you think this is mechanical or inflammatory.
All right. Well, I'm going to go with inflammatory and, and Dr. Gorman also inflammatory, but with a question mark, I'm going to agree with you. All right. Let's see if we were right. Next slide. Jennifer. Yeah. So I put this case in because, you know, I keep harping on pain is not a big component of J, but um, in our kids with enthesitis related arthritis, they will have a significant amount of pain. And especially because they get a fasciitis and the um, and uh, tendonitis, especially the plantar fascia. So if you, you guys are very good at diagnosing sievers, but if you see more to the story like ankle swelling, then don't be fooled by the fact that they have pain because they, they really will literally wear flip-flops and so forth because the foot and the, the bottom of the feet are so painful. And so you're quite right about inflammatory, though he has many other things that are consistent with what we've been talking about this morning. He's got a lot of morning stiffness. You see swelling about the ankle. It's there. It's been, and he's had pain in his foot for almost two months. And then the next slide, please. And then your, your exam is, you, you know, you see a big difference between the right and the left. There's a lot of bogginess, and we'll show you what that means. I, uh, by exam, Shannon will help us with that again. And it's warm. And then you see swelling over the insertion of the right Achilles tendon. This is enthesitis. This would be uh, not uh, what you would see with Sievers or some of the, the more mechanical things that you guys deal with. So um, next slide. So it is re worth reviewing just a tad bit of the anatomy of the ankle because the ankle is actually, you know, three joints in one. Uh, and uh, this is something that you will want to be part of your exam and it doesn't take very long at all. So the first part of the joint is the tibio-talar joint and you're looking for movement in flexion and extension. Um, and uh, that would be the evaluation of that particular joint. Next slide, please. The one that gives the person the, a lot of pain in their feet and a big reason besides all the fasciitis and tendonitis uh, gives them pain is because the subtalar joint, I, I don't have a pointer, but you can see, it's where the tibia and talus, uh, you know, juxtapose the calcaneus. And that joint is quite small. So if there's inflammation in there, there's just not enough room for any of the swelling and it becomes quite painful. So when you're assessing it, you're holding the calcaneus and you're looking for movement about the subtalar joint and you need to do that very gently, um, inverting and everting because if, if they have uh, arthritis there, they're gonna be jumping off the table if you just go real quick. And then the next slide, please. Then the other are to um, assess the midfoot and the toes. Um, those are sometimes a bit easier because you can see the swelling visibly in the midfoot and you can assess movement. And then the toes are similar to looking at fingers. So next slide, please. So again, you wanna start by inspecting. Look at both ankles, look at the front and the back. It's especially important to have them lay uh, with face down and look at the back of the ankles. That's where you're going to see differences in, in swelling the easiest. Um, and then, you know, when they're standing, you can look to see if they have an unusually high arch or pest planus that would make for more mechanical things. And then dactylitis, we reviewed this the last time, but is the sausage digit. If you see a toe that's swollen, the whole toe, it looks swollen. That's, uh, that comes to us. That's psoriatic arthritis, and that's um, something that comes to rheumatology regardless. Yeah. Next slide. And then um, this again is inspection. This is what we're referring to. You wanna look at the back of the ankle uh, along the Achilles tendon. Um, and if you see asymmetry, then that would be more than likely make this inflammatory. And you can see in that right ankle that they're swelling medially and, um, and on the outer part of the ankle. Next slide. And then when the uh, ankle gets involved, also it's a little hard to depict in this picture, but the posterior tibial that comes along the tibial tendon that comes along the medial aspect of the ankle gets quite swollen. And that's what you're seeing there. And again, any tendon, fascia, and the seeds that get swollen, those are really painful. Um, next slide, please. 
And then, then this is just the example of pest planus and then a photo just reviewing what dactylitis looks like. Next slide, please. Um, and then you know, want to palpate along the emphases and you can see in this picture on the right side uh, that this person has a lot of swelling along the Achilles tendon. So that would be the enthesitis. Next slide. And then uh, Shannon's going to demonstrate the range of motion. So I think this is this can be for your reference. You're not going to be measuring the degrees. You're just going to see if it's the same on both sides and if it's extra flexible or not so flexible. And I think we'll let Shannon demonstrate that in the, in her video. This will be the assessment and examination of the foot and ankle. We're going to look at both inflammatory and mechanical issues that you may encounter. So starting with the patient standing, you would look at their foot position. You would look at it from the front. You would be looking to see if they have um, an angle here or in looking at pes planus. You could also assess their toes to see if you see any inflammation or redness. You can also palpate along the top of the foot to see if they have any subtalar swelling. You would then have them turn around and you look at them from the back. You would look at position here, calcaneal position. You might see some valgus, which would indicate some mechanical um, issues where they may need an insert. And if you give them some uh, support here, you would see an improvement in the alignment there. Uh, turn back around. Dave is going to show us if you see a little bit of a modification here and you see an asymmetry there, that might be an indicator that there could be some inflammation there along with visible swelling. You would then have them lie on their back on the table. While they're lying down, you would have them move on their own, their feet up, feet down, and then in and out to see if there's any asymmetry. You also would move it on your own. You'd move up and down in and out, up, down, in and out. And again, you can assess for any toe inflammation or redness if it was inflammatory, any swelling, heat for inflammatory. Um, and then you can lay on your stomach. While they're on their stomach, you can assess along the Achilles tendon and see the tendons along um, the sides as well as the malleoli. And you can again, up, down, in and out, up, down, in and out, feeling for um, any loss of motion or excessive motion, if it would be mechanical. And I think that's our only video for foot and ankle. So I will pause. And actually, Haley, can you go to the next slide just to make sure I'm correct? Go one more slide. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So we'll pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions about foot or ankle presentation exam? I have a question that I'm going to ask. Um, so Shannon, you had mentioned about inserts. Um, can, can you, because I get this question all the time, sort of briefly discuss sort of the value. Is it worth having families go out and just get like over the counter, like going to, to Walmart and get over the counter inserts versus kind of having custom orthotics that, that you all would make? Is, is there, you know, can, do you have any comments about that? Uh, sure. sure. Um, are you, do we have some? feedback. Come talk at mine. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah. Little little behind the scene text. Jennifer and Shannon are in the same room, so getting a little feedback. So all right. Perfect. Um so that's a great question. Um one issue that we do find is that if you go over the counter, occasionally families will pick up like a gel type insert. Um, and it might be comfortable for someone who has some inflammation, um, but it does cause some instability of the foot and ankle. Um, and especially with hypermobility, if they're complaining of pain, but you don't think it's um, inflammatory, 
giving them a gel insert is just going to cause more instability, more movement in a joint that's already moving around a lot. Um, here in the clinic, we do not do a lot of um, full customized orthotics. Uh, we carry a brand here, um, and there's various types that are similar to that. We carry something called Vasily Orthotics, but there's something called, um, you can do like Superfeet or other, there are other over-the-counter um, inserts that work well, um, but it provides uh, stability, but also allows some, allows some um, uh, mobility still to occur in the foot and ankle. Um, so just sending someone to like the store to get them is we don't typically recommend that. However, sometimes the ones that we carry here, they don't tolerate. So then I'll give them suggestions on ones that they can buy at the store. If you are, you know, like, hey, let's just go get one. The big, the big take home would be avoid gel. Um, there's a really nice one. It's like $6. It's called a Tri Comfort. It's got, you know, a heel, a little bit of cushion at the heel, a little bit of like a plastic support at the arch and then it's three quarter length. And those tend to go well as like a beginning, as a beginning one to use. Um, the nice thing about the ones that we have here is that they are off the shelf, but we have the ability to semi-customize them. So we can add in some posts, you know, forefoot or rear foot posts, or we can add in a um, heel lift that attaches to the orthotic to, um, to help with like a leg length discrepancy. So again, take home is avoid gel. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we're going to move on for time's sake to our next stream. But if you have questions about either the knee or the, the foot ankle, please enter them in the chat box and, and we'll make sure we get to address those. So our next case is, is a little four-year-old who comes in and parents note that, that she's having difficulty holding a fork. She previously was able to use a fork and spoon, but now prefers to use her fingers. She chooses not to color. She has trouble opening doors. And when you ask her, she says that her wrists are stuffed in the morning and she does not seem to be in any pain. Next slide. On exam, some of her fingers will not bend to make a fist. She uses her forearms to get on the exam table. You find noticeable swelling and increased warmth of both wrists and she has decreased range of motion in both wrists. Next slide. All right, mechanical or inflammatory? Again, just put it in the chat box. No worries if, if it's, it's you're incorrect, that's what we're here to learn. All right, Dr. Gorman again is semi-confidently going with inflammatory again. Inflammatory, good, thank you. I would agree, I think it's inflammatory. Jennifer, were we right? Next slide, please. I'm sending my kids to you guys. Yes, absolutely right. Um, and this is not an un uncommon. The, it's the first time ever that I had, I asked the four-year-old, how are you when you wake up in the morning? And she said, my wrists are stuffed because they're very, they were very, very swollen. But we get a couple of these a year where they first get sent to developmental or one person was being sent to genetics. Uh, because you know they lost a milestone, they were using their utensils, and now all of a sudden don't. So don't don't forget about us in that situation. Uh, so the, the stuff means morning stiffness, and she really doesn't have much pain. Next slide, please. Um, and this is, uh, I believe, Shannon demonstrates it in the video. But you know, you guys don't have time to look at every joint of every uh, of the fingers and the hand. So a quick thing is just to ask them can they make a fist not like this but a fist like this because you if they can't get all their fingers back there's probably something wrong in one of them um if they, they go like this they'll they'll try to cheat because they don't want you to think they have anything wrong so they might go like this you want them to go like this and then watch them get on the exam table because instead of putting their hand down to get on they'll use their forearms to get on just to avoid the pressure of the wrist and then she has swelling and warmth and decreased range of motion about the wrists. Next slide, please. And then I don't think we need to review the anatomy of the hand. Just, I think when I was in primary care, I could never remember which was proximal, middle, distal. 
anyway, so this is a this is for your reference of it. It's really not that important for you. Just look to see if it moves, and if it doesn't, uh, then then it needs to come to us. If it's not trauma, next slide, please. Um, so again, you're looking for asymmetry uh, in the hands or the wrists. Um, you want to again look how they get on the exam table, and uh, you know. Also for mechanical, you wanna to look to see how they use a writing utensil because, uh, because they have a hard time holding a pencil or they even, uh, in, even mechanical kids will have a hard time using their fork or spoon. It's just that they, they developed that very late. So it's not like they had it and they lost it like happened in this case. Okay, next slide, please. And then this is just some examples of inflammatory. So you can see the thumbs don't compare. So this is something that I think you can do pretty, pretty quickly. And you can see, uh, I can't point, but if you look in the left hand, the uh, PIP, which would be the second joint, the middle joint, you can see how much more swollen that is than on the other side. And then this poor kid on the far right, you know, his wrists are or her wrists are very swollen. And you can usually observe that, you know, just by the time you walk in, or they'll just hold their hands like they don't really want to move them if it's inflammatory. Versus the next slide. Um, when you're assessing your people with hypermobility, once you figure out they're hypermobile, look to see how they hold their pencil because they usually have a death grip on the pencil or pen and, um, and they may use multiple fingers. By the time they get to occupational therapy, they're not going to train, try to change how they hold the pencil, but they're going to make it easier for them with different modifications. Next slide, please. And then, you know, the, the same thing, inspection, then palpation, look for warmth, and you can usually feel the bogginess about the wrist. Even the fingers you can, but you don't need to, just make them make a fist. Next slide. And then I think we're gonna let uh, Shannon demonstrate this again, the range of motion. Next slide, yeah. Oh, this is the hypermobility again. Um, I, we went through this already, so again, next slide. This will be assessment of the wrist and hand indicating inflammation. The first thing you would do is you'd have the patient get up onto the table, but observe and watch as they get up and watch what they do with their hands. Fisting and pushing up that way is a protective mechanism of the wrist and they indicate that they have discomfort or inflammation of the wrist. You would then palpate the wrist feeling for warmth um, or inflammation that you may feel in the wrist, hand or fingers. And you would compare both side to side. You would have the patient bring their wrist up bring their wrist down, bring them in and out, and then also have them make a fist um, with their hands in a claw position. And you may see that they have one finger or several fingers that don't go all the way down into the full fist position, which may indicate inflammation that's occurring in the fingers. Haley, if you wanna to go to the next one and then we've got mechanical and play that, thank you. This will be an assessment of the wrist and hand um, that is indicating mechanical cause. So again, you would want to see the patient get up onto the table and watch what they do with their wrists and possibly their elbows. Um, we see full wrist extension, a little bit of elbow hyperextension. You then look at the wrist um, feeling to see if there's any inflammation there and then also look at range of motion, both in and out. Seeing excessive motion here, you then could do a quick assessment of finger and wrist extension. Seeing that there's excessive motion there, indicating more of a mechanical reason for the uh, pain versus inflammation. Great, we have one more joint to get to. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna move on, but if you have questions about the wrist or the hand, please put them in the chat box and Jennifer and Shannon can, can reply. Um, so our last case of the morning is a 12 year old soccer player who presents with low back pain. We all know when we see that on our schedule, there's just a little bit of a groan, right? Low back pain, very common complaint that we see in our primary care offices. The pain has been intermittent and present for several weeks. The pain is worse after a soccer game or practice no morning stiffness, 
There is some relief with ibuprofen and all of the other joints are normal. Next slide. On exam, you find no tenderness to palpation over the sacroiliac joints. Patrick's tests and Schober tests are normal and you note that his hamstrings are tight. Next slide. All right, one more time, mechanical or inflammatory? Please enter in the chat box. Okay, we have a couple guesses for mechanical. I'm gonna agree, I think. I think there was enough in there that, that sort of pointed towards mechanical. Jennifer, were we right? You guys are amazing. You didn't really need this hour of your morning. Yes, you did great. The pain's intermittent. It's worse after soccer. There's no morning stiffness. And then a couple of key things on the exam were normal. So next slide, the Patrick's and the Schober. And um, you don't need to know, you, you should not have known beforehand what these are, but we're going to show you because these are uh, it's very rare for the back to be involved in our inflammatory arthritis. The only time would be in the enthesitis, and then that would be in the sacroiliac joint. So we're going to help you assess those. Um, uh, and then, because otherwise, I personally suffer from low back pain sometimes too, and the PT is amazing uh, help. So next slide, please. Again, just for sake of time, you don't don't necessarily need to know the anatomy, except for if you focus on the sacroiliac joints, which are highlighted in red, those are the areas that the back can be involved in. Usually, very rarely, uh, in more so in adulthood, and if so, it's usually going to be a teenager, not a young child. So next slide. Um, and then you want to do the usual look for leg length discrepancy. You look for scoliosis, which you guys are pros at. So next slide is. Um, and then palpation, you do want to palpate or even pound over the SI joint and maybe also look for if there's any trauma to the lumbar vertebrae. But the next slide. Um, so this is the Patrick's test or figure four. And you, I think, believe Shannon demonstrates this in her video. So we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, you'll have this for your reference. You want to see mobility about the back and especially the Schober. So the Schobers is demonstrated here on the right where you mark right at the sacroiliac dimples and then 10 centimeters above. And then you ask them to bend forward and you're looking for the normal lumbar lordosis and that it extends you know, five centimeters or more. Um, and I think it's most important to watch Shannon. Next slide. This will show an assessment of a low back looking at characteristics that could indicate inflammation or mechanical cause. First would be observing, seeing how the patient is standing. Um, with this patient, her leg is um, externally rotated out to the side and a little bit of a knee flexed, um, which may indicate a leg length discrepancy. I could come in and look at the hips and look at the pelvis to see if the pelvis is symmetric or asymmetric. She's high on the left, on the right side, so it would um, give me indication that she may have a leg length discrepancy with the right leg being long. I would then come and look at her from the back. I'd have her bend over. I would be able to do a scoliosis screen and also look at um, lumbar flexion in this position. As she comes up, I would be able to then come down and um, palpate the sacroiliac joint and if there is pain upon palpation, and if the patient reports pain, it may indicate that there is um, inflammation of the um, SI joint. I would then have the patient lie on the table. In this position, I can reassess the uh, leg length discrepancy by bringing the toes up and looking down, seeing that that right leg is indeed long. Um, if I come and do the Faber's test, cross the leg over, one hand on the other hip, pressing down here. If there's a reproduction of pain in the back, um, in between, um, in, the, in, the, in the back area, it would indicate some inflammation because we are stressing that SI joint. If there's pain in other areas, it would be more of an indicator of um, a mechanical issue. At this point, you could also assess with, for the low back, if there is tightness in the hip joints um, or the hamstring 
which there is, which would then indicate more of a mechanical, mechanical cost. Great, next slide. So um, one is kind of- Can I just say one, one last of thing? Of course right? you can. Yeah. So the one thing I want to point out from today's presentation is that all of this assessment is based on the history and the physical exam. Do not be fooled by blood work. Blood work can be normal and they can have rip-roaring arthritis or they can have inflammation in their blood for some other reason and not have arthritis. So the absence of blood work in the evaluation of these children is intentional because um, it, it's something that we do once we think it's inflammatory, but don't let that guide where you, where you send them. And we're happy, we're always happy if you send us somebody you think has arthritis and they don't. So I don't, I did primary care, I know how hard it is. So we're always here to help you. It's not a problem, but, um, but we also know that, that you guys like to uh, get it right as you did all day today. So uh, good job. And now I, now I will be quiet, Chris. No, you're fine. That was perfect. And I love that. You know, I teach a lot of medical students in my office and just the key of, you know, the importance of history and physical exam is, is so key. There's Jennifer and, and my emails. If you have questions, please let us know. We didn't list Shannon's email, but we can definitely get up oh, and she just posted that in there. So thank you. Um, and say we can definitely get questions to her. Next slide, please. Just want to sort of tease a couple of things. The, the second half of our webinar series, this is a series of four. This was the second one. On Wednesday, January 19th, um, we are going to go over sort of treatment options for inflammatory arthritis. And then the following month of February, we're going to have a multidisciplinary panel um, with Dr. Huggins, most likely a psychologist, um, another rheumatologist, and also a, a, a patient and kind of talking about sort of dealing with chronic pain. So we hope you can join us for those. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, just wanted to let you know that as part of this project, we have an upcoming journal club um, that there is much more in-depth information. We've pulled 10 different articles that kind of span um, lots of different topics. There's a, one article that just focuses on hypermobility. So um, you can get 20 points of MOC part two credit. Some more information is coming soon. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank Dr. Huggins and especially thank Shannon. Um, and um, I think her children were, were involved in the making of this videos. So, so those are just fantastic. Um, I know it's nine o'clock. If you have to hop off, go ahead. I just, I can't, I've got a question that's been burning in me for a long time. And so I'm going to ask Jennifer and Shannon, if you need to hop off, that's fine. But I, you know, I, I, I typically, well, when I see a, a child with, with sort of joint pain, I often will start, unless I'm worried that it's inflammatory, often we'll start with referring to physical therapy. And I've noted that over the last several years, get that report back from physical therapy that we're seeing more and more kids with a diagnosis of hypermobility. Is this just something that, you know, maybe similar to autism where we have more stringent diagnostic criteria and we're more aware of it? Or do you think we're truly seeing more hypermobility that we weren't seeing before? I might start and then see. I, um, I think you guys are seeing this even more than us, but um, you know it's autosomally dominantly inherited. One in a hundred children are flexible. I think we're seeing way. You guys can uh, uh, attest to this, but I think we're seeing way more kids in pain, and uh, and so they're getting to us more because. But there's lots of different reasons for that pain. COVID hasn't helped, but also immobility because of all the electronic devices or the sports, you know, it used to be you could play four or five different sports and just sort of enjoy being active. And now the intensity of the sport, you know, you're going to be a pretty good at the sport if you're flexible, but the intensity of the sport makes it so that you, you injure yourself more from the hypermobility. So I think it's the uh, presence of pain that's bringing these people to us more. And I don't, Shannon's shaking her head. You can come over here if you want. I know too. You, you I did. Your computer, like, oh. Let's try this. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna go over. Yeah. <laughs> Shannon's going to come over to, to Jennifer's. And again, if you need to hop off, go ahead. Um, but uh, this is just something that's been on my mind for a while. And while I have these experts here, I wanted to, to ask them that. Go ahead, Shannon. 
No, I agree with Dr. Huggins. I think that, um, you know, the, the phones, um, you know, the mechanics that uh, kids are um, involved with just because of just the nature of electronics just in general. Um, the high level of sport participation, I agree as well. Um, you know, I do think that there is more, more awareness of it. Um, you know, like, hey, I'm hypermobile. I, I've been to the doctor and I have this. So there's like conversations between patients and families. Um, and they are trying to, even with the nomenclature that uh, Dr. Huggins brought up earlier, really calling it more um, hypermobility spectrum disorder. So similar to the autism, right? So, so it's not that it's more present necessarily, but there are varying levels of it. So there are some individuals who are incapacitated because of the level of uh, mobility that they have, but some of it is that they just haven't learned how to, um, to move their bodies correctly or have the, the proper strengthening, or they stopped acting they stopped their activity because it was too painful. Again, going back to Dr. Huggins' statement about pain. Um, and then that, that then limits them from moving. And so then they become more immobile, more pain, and then, and then um, incapacitated. Versus we have high level athletes that, that come to us and they have just, just this generalized pain. They're thinking about quitting their sport, but we just work on a couple of things, posture, you know, core strength, and we can get them back to their sport. And um, I always tell every patient that comes to me with hypermobility, like you can do whatever you want to do. We just need to help you to do that. And so just physical therapy in general is just um, a, a great way to, you know, your patients that are feeling um, discouraged or feel like they, they're going to need to quit their sport. Um, just coming and seeing physical therapy might um, give them just, you know, um, encouragement, but also an understanding of how to protect their bodies and how, how to properly rest, like Dr. Huggins said, with the sports, you know, year round sports, like your body does need some rest time from those activities. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you for our attendees. Um, again, we'll be sending out information for CME credit and a link with the slides and then look forward to both the journal club as well as our um, the last two of our presentations in the series in 2022. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Well, we pulled it off, I think.